Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Today I'm very excited. I have with me Mary Roberts. She is a friend of mine. She partook in the Carnivore 75 Hard Movement and she also helped me set up the Carnivore Meetup in back in November of 2019. We are going to talk about her journey on Carnivore and her stints on Carnivore and her weight gain on a keto Carnivore diet. And we also talk about our relationships with food and food addiction and just healing all of that. All right, I look forward to you guys watching this. Let's get right into it. So Mary, thanks again for joining me. Um, if you can introduce yourself for those that don't know you. Thanks for having me again. Uh, my name's Mary Roberts and I am a coach for Keto Evangelist Coaching. I've been keto for over six years and I first uh, started carnivore uh, in like fall of 2018. Um, and I'm like, you know, off and on, I wouldn't say I'm strict carnivore, but I am mostly carnivore. I have a very heavy meat based diet and I've done, um, you know, periods of like where I'm strictly meat. Um, I over like the reason that I started keto over six years ago was because I was obese at 260 pounds. I had type two diabetes with uh, A1C over nine. I had psoriasis, high blood pressure, uh, high triglycerides. I had asthma and allergy issues. I had like, I was a hot mess of <laughs> all these, you know, health issues. And so I heard about, uh, you know, I'd already been dabbled in low carb a couple times, Atkins specifically. And so I decided I was going to do Atkins again. And then when I was like a few days into that, a friend told me about keto and I'd never heard the K word before. So I looked it up and then I, I, from that point I started keto and it changed everything for me. Um, it was the first time that I uh, was able to like lose weight and not feel like I was on a diet and suffering. Um, and it also started, I started feeling better, which in the past, you know, doing just calorie restriction, like via Weight Watchers or severe caloric restriction, I never really felt better. And I was always like white knuckling it and having to use willpower, which only lasted so long because I am a food addict and, you know, I'm eating just a lifelong eating disorder. So that kind of stuff was never sustainable for me. So keto changed my life. And then I stepped it up and, you know, started hearing about carnivore um, in 2018. And I was at my goal weight back then. Um, and so I thought, Oh, well, you know, I'll do carnivore. That sounds great. I heard all these great things about it. I'd already reversed all my health issues and, um, lost the weight and simply tried carnivore because it was just, you know, something new to try and Hey, it was zero carbon. I like meat. <laughs> so why not? Um, so yeah, so that's kind of it. And then I've, you know, since I've been carnivore, there's been other things, you know, I'm 48 and so I'm going through, you know, I'm perimenopausal right now. And I've experienced a lot of things that other people have experienced on carnivore. Do you, you know, when you do your stints of strict carnivore, do you feel a difference than when you are, you know, more keto carnivore or, you know, with a little bit of plants? I, I do. Um, when I am strict carnivore, I have um, a much more diminished appetite. Mm. Uh, so like, it's harder for me to eat enough when I'm, when I'm carnivore. Um, and, but I mean, that's really the, the main thing. And my, um, blood sugar is a little bit lower. Like I normally, I maintain an A1C of like 4.9. Um, but always when I do carnivore, it goes down a little bit. Um, so that's like the two main things. And then what about weight loss? So, um, you know, on carnivore, do you notice that your weight is kind of similar to when you're keto? Um, so when I, the very first time that I tried carnivore, I like, I lost seven pounds in seven days. I was oh, already wow. like at, at my goal. And, you know, at that point, like I was fairly shocked that I lost more weight. But then it came back on and then, then, and then gradually since that fall of 2018, I've put on about 20, 25 pounds, depending on the day. Um, mm -hmm. And I, it's been pretty frustrating, but you know, now through things I've learned and talking to other people and, you know, research and stuff, I understand that that 
you know, happens to people. But I think it's, I think it was like a double whammy for me um, between the carnivore and the hormonal, you know, the, just being on track for um, menopause. In my family, my mother and my grandmothers all were post menopause at age 50. So it was like, I'm right in that, oh, that zone. Um, so I think that the, the two combined, that's accounts for the weight gain because I don't ever cheat. I don't binge and carnivore. I mean, when I'm strict carnivore, I'm like, I'm zero carb. And I, I'm not one of those people that does like the, you know, I'm not eating like three, 400 grams of protein a day, piles, of what I would call piles and pounds of meat. That's not what I'm doing. <laughs> so. So would you say that you haven't really changed your diet, but, or the amount of food you eat, but then you still kind of gain that amount? Yeah, I did not really change the amount. I mean, my protein is definitely higher, sure. um, but I lowered my fat. You know, when I'm, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't do like a lot of added fat. Like I very rarely use butter. I don't really, um, I throw my meats in the air fryer. So like there's no... I don't add, I'm not like putting it in a pan and adding fats. I don't do a lot of added fat. So the fat that I get is, um, you know, strictly from the meats. And so some days I choose fattier cuts and other days they're leaner. But so my fat tends to be like 55 to 70% of my calories. Whereas before on keto, I was doing a lot of added fat and it was much higher than my protein. And I would, I like on average ate like 80 to 85% of my calories from fat. Did you feel a difference with that? Like, did you feel a difference when you were eating higher fat versus more higher protein now? I did not be like energy wise. Like my energy is very steady. I very rarely have like a, a day where I'm like, Ugh, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't have like this, like up and down with my energy. It's fairly steady. I sleep well. Um, I always feel rested when I wake up. I don't have like energy, like I'm not on any type of like energy roller coaster. Gotcha. The main difference is I weighed less on keto than, than carnivore. But I also know that because I get regular DEXA scans, I've put on body, I put on muscle too. Um, but yeah, but my body fat percentage has gone up on carnivore, which is really kind of annoying. Um, but I like, I, I prefer to, I prefer this over, you know, like, you know, all the vegetables on, I just don't like vegetables. I prefer to eat carnivore. I wonder, um, I mean, have you ever considered, um, eating like a keto version of carnivore, meaning that you have, you know, maybe you eat a little less protein in a day, but then you add more fat. I have, I've done, I have tried all of the, <laughs> I've done it all. Like at, where I've like done, you know, I've done different um, ratios of keto macros and, and, and done all that, you know, and like, right, you know, right now I'm not really, um, I mean, I'm definitely in the higher protein camp right now, but the last, I mean, I kind of fluctuate like this. I have like this five pound window where I basically stay the same. Mm -hmm. um, so. I, you know, it's not, my scale's not changing either way with what I've been doing. You know, I would think like the last at least six months, like sometimes I can get it to go down like six or seven pounds, but then it comes back. So, so what have you then been trying to do to kind of, you know, help you maybe lose some of the weight that you gained during per perimenopause? So what I've been doing lately, and it's it, right now, like it, the strategy is ramping up my, I'm working, I work with the coach um, and the strategy is ramping up my metabolism so that I can see if I, if when I do a cut and, you know, start like reducing calories, if the weight will, will come off. So I'm actually been eating, this is the other interesting thing. I'm eating in a surplus and have for quite a while. And yet I stay in that like five pound window, like the amount of calories I'm eating, if it was really calories in calories out. I should have, I should be away a lot more. Right. Um, are, are you incorporating fasting? I think I saw on one of your Instagram posts that you started yeah. doing a little bit more extended fasting. Do, do you want to talk about that? And is sure. it healthy? Yeah, I do the, I do the daily intermittent fast right now, since we've been in quarantine, um, <laughs> we've been at home. I averaged like 18 to 22 hours a day. Okay. Um, prior to that, I was doing like just 16 hours, but then once a week I was doing 36 to 42 ish hours. 
But for whatever reason, I got off track on that. And I haven't done an extended fast beyond 24 hours in the last month or so. So I'm just doing the daily intermittent fasting of like, you know, 18 to 22 hours. But I'm a huge fan of fasting. I've definitely done it before. I've, I've done multiple like four to six day fasts, you know, over the last several years. And I really like it. But it, you really have to be like in a certain mindset too. And for whatever reason, my mind is not it's not on board for extended fasting right now, but I am, I, I'm a fan. No, that's good. I think, um, you know, I, I always say that, you know, the science is there that fasting is beneficial for your body for cleanup for even increasing your metabolic rate. But if you're bio individually not ready right now, or in that time, then you have to honor your body more than science. And so that totally makes sense. I mean, we're home 24 seven now. So <laughs> it's harder to fast when you know, a lot of times we eat for boredom, or you know, we're just not as busy. Um, and so if extended fasting doesn't work right now, then that's fine, right. And I think you're in a good place where it makes sense that you're, you know, just doing what works for you. Um, but what about um, in general? So you know, what what do you generally kind of eat in a day then right now? Um, ribeyes either like so i'm trying to think like what did i the last this week is not i ha, i have to like think further beyond this week. this week unfortunately i have not even eaten very much because my poor doggy died oh, yeah, on, I'm sorry. on monday and it's been a very emotional week i haven't really wanted to eat but like on average you know like chicken wings and ribeyes you know um, or chuck roast is, I'm kind of into chuck roast lately, throwing like the big thick ones, like in the air fryer. Um, but I mean, really that's like red meat and chicken wings mostly. And then occasionally I have lamb. I also do beef liver and I'll have the, our local butcher, like ground up a ribeye with, with beef liver and I'll make, mm -hmm. you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make the combination, like make burger patties out of it or, or like a meatloaf of beef liver and ribeye meatloaf. Um, I keep it really simple. I don't, I mean, occasionally I get lamb, um, mm -hmm. and occasionally a chicken thigh, but I, I mostly just like eating the, the steak. And then, um, we, I live in the barbecue capital of Texas. So one of our barbecue places has prime rib on the weekends. And so I, sometimes I pick up prime rib on, on the weekend. So how that's much, my favorite. How many um, pounds of meat would you say you eat in a day? Probably two. Two. Okay. Yeah. And then you don't really add fat. Not really. No, but, but like, you know, when I get prime rib, I don't need to, it's already like yeah. so fatty and ribeye is already fair. Like it's Pretty. not super fatty, but um, I think really it's like the only 70, time 30. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, really, the only time I add fat is like when my husband and I go out to to Texas Roadhouse and I order mm -hmm. the prime rib. I do ask for their whipped butter because I, you know, I'm like, okay, this is an opportunity to use the whipped butter. I'll do it, but I don't really, I don't do it at home. For people that are keto and carnivore, maybe not really going through perimenopause. I mean, what what would you say would help people to kind of manage their weight? Right, like one thing, for example, is. Some people say that um, just believing that you can just eat all the meat you want mm -hmm. and not worry about how much you're eating is like, don't worry about it on carnivore. Maybe while you're yeah. transitioning, yes. But um, I think people are finding that you should be wary of the amount you're eating and obviously don't under eat, but figure out, you know, a amount that's healthy. Um, do you have any recommendations for people that are, you know, kind of frustrated with keto or carnivore and being stuck um, either they're not losing weight or maybe they've even gained some weight. So it depends on what the scenario is. Um, but if, if the goal is to lose weight, then I recommend, you know, then keep keeping your carnivore, you know, keeping your carnivore diet with ketogenic macros, like be at the 65 to 75% fat range, keep your protein under 30%. Um, you know, that's, and, and doing some sort of exercise I think is important. I, I personally recommend weightlifting. I think that it makes the most sense for people that need to lose weight because it's going to improve their insulin sensitivity. They're going to, it's going to help them maintain or gain muscle mass, which is really important, especially the older that we get. So, I mean, that would be like my first, you know, thing is like follow the macros, but, um, the, but for most people, 
the problem is not really, it's not that keto isn't working. It's not that carnivore isn't working. It's that their relationship with food is dysfunctional and they don't stay strict keto. They don't stay strict carnivore. Um, they, you know, quote, fall off the wagon once a week. You know, some people, or some people put planned cheats in, in there because they can't, they're so emotionally attached to the carbs that they can't picture life, you know, with, without them. And so they sabotage themselves by, by not staying on plan. And I know, you know, people think, oh, well, once a week's not going to hurt. But if you are just starting, well, mm -hmm. you know, when people first start, like it takes several days for ketosis to occur. And ketosis is not the same thing as being fat adapted. So if you start out, this is what I think people don't understand. If you start out and it takes you four to six days to get into ketosis, you get into ketosis and then you're like, bam, here's my first cheat meal because I'm going to cheat every Sunday. And then you throw yourself out, then it's going to take you several days to get back in. So you're lucky if you're in ketosis one or two days a week and you're not going to get fat adapted that way. So you're just like spinning your wheels. And so nothing, you know, nothing happens for them. And then they're like, well, keto didn't work for me or carnivore didn't work for me. Right. But you can't really say that that's what you were doing because you are including carbs and they wreak havoc, especially if you are really overweight and severely insulin resistant. It's not going to do you any favors to, to have cheat days or carb ups. Right. I totally agree. I mean, um, you know, we really, it always goes back to that. No diet is going to fix your relationship right. with food. Right. And, you know, I think this is a testament, right? This whole pandemic and us being stressed out, uh, we watch the news or, you know, anything that's going on and it's, it's scary. It's putting us in this chronic stress state and we're probably pumping out cortisol which then will drive our desire to eat sugar right um right. and so a lot of people are kind of falling off the wagon and if you want to call it that because you know it's uh well this is a state of survival kind of thought process and then they go back to comforting with sugar um and it shows that you know maybe all the work hasn't been done even if you were carnivore for months and months and months um we really need to address that mental aspect of food addiction and turning to food to cope because you can remove all the sugar, but then the mental aspect will always be there. So when we have something like a pandemic or just something that's really high stress in our lives, we need to have something else in place that we will no longer turn to food. Um, right. There's, there seems to be this myth that I see it in this on social media all the time that, you know, all that all you have to do is cut the carbs out. If you go keto or better yet, if you're carnivore, bam, no more cravings and you're fixed. But that is not true. Like I see people, what I like when they post stuff, I, I would describe it as a bit like people are binging on meat. They're, they're eating a lot more meat than they likely need. Um, and I, I, so it's not true that you that carbs are the only thing that people are addicted to or binge on. There's that emotional. Maybe carbs are the physical. You know, you're yeah. going to get physical cravings from carbs. But if you have an emotionally, you know, uh, emotional attachment to food and you seek out, you eat for comfort and soothing, you can binge on meat too. Like there are people that 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 do it. So it's just. You know, it's, it's not true that just changing what you eat will fix everything. You've got to like, look to, well, why, why did you get into this position in the first place? How, like, how did I become 260 pounds? I became 260 pounds because I was binging all the time. I was addicted to sugar, but it wasn't just carbs that I overate. I would over, you know, I overate anything, um, whatever was you know available. So those, the reasons why we turn to food are what needs to be addressed. And if those are never addressed, then you just continue on the roller coaster, whether you're, you know, carnivore or not. And, uh, you know, I think people don't, the, the food is so numbing that it's sometimes hard for people to even identify like what, what's, you know, going on. Um, but you know, that, that has to be, you have, you have to look at the reason why people think that, food, you know, they're like, I'm an emotional eater. And they really do think food makes them feel better, but it doesn't. It really doesn't. The only thing they're getting is that in the moment, it tastes good. 
But before they're even done doing what they're doing, their own guilt, like they're already attacking themselves with guilt. They're already feeling bad. They're already plotting for their starting over and they're still eating. Um, so it's this endless, you know, you stay in that endless cycle. Right. I mean, it's just this, you know, we, we find our body, our minds, um, we try to find ways to kind of autopilot everything because we only have a finite amount of decision-making energy in our lives. Right. And so every day, once we find a habit and it kind of, or once we find an action, like a reward that basically benefits us. Um, Maybe it's the release of dopamine. And then we're like, Oh, that was a good reward. I'm going to remember it. And then I'm going to keep at it whenever that kind of cue occurs or that situation occurs. And so we use that with food, right? So when we're young, we cry, then we're given a lollipop or we're given ice cream or we're given breast milk even. Um, And then as we grow, we just always celebrate or we comfort with food. And so yes, we can kind of remove that food addiction in physically from sugar, but there's still the emotional side, which most people don't address because then what happens, even if you're a carnivore for a year and a stressful time hits, what if your loved one dies, right? Right. What if something that is where it puts you in a highly emotional state and you're in the fight or flight mode, your mind will then autopilot to use whatever mechanism or habit that you use to comfort and that'll end up being food. And so if you don't have the proper mechanisms in place, then when you're highly stressed out, your sound mind can't be like, no, don't eat sugar. You're just going to be like, I don't care right now. Right. And then just go for it. Um, And whatever it is. And I think, you know, as people are doing carnivore longer than just the veteran carnivores, we're seeing it. Right. So people are binging off of cheese, right. People are binging Mm -hmm. off of a, deli meats and sausages like for me I cut out dairy because I was like okay I'm going to try to be healthier and I'm going to cut out dairy and I cut it out for five months I thought maybe I'll lose some weight but what I noticed is instead of snacking on the dairy I started eating pork rinds uh, (laughs) and other sausages and beef jerkies and deli meats and and I didn't lose any weight because I replaced one junky kind of you know snacking emotional eating for another And then, um, but I've never removed all of that, right? Where it's only meals. Um, But I bet you I would do it even in that scenario, right? And maybe I'd eat more in one sitting. I don't know. But um, what I, it's just time and time again, yes, you can remove the major culprits, but without changing the mental state and finding another kind of um, habit or action you could use when you're in these fight or flight states, you're going to always end up turning back to food because we need something to cope, but you have to figure out what that kind of thing will be for you. Like, what did you use? Like, what have you used to kind of, you know, when you're highly stressed and you used to eat, like, what do you do now? So what I do now is different than like in the beginning, but like I, you know, in the beginning, there were certain things, sacrifices I had to to make. Like one of my, you know, when I work with clients, we talk about, you know, danger zones, uh, uh, another thing to call people call them triggers. Like what are your triggers? What are your danger zones? For me, one of my biggest danger zones was nighttime in front of the TV. Um, that was, everybody would go to bed and it was time for me to like turn on the DVR, watch general hospital and catch up on like all my shows. Right. So that was my binge time. And in order for, and and, like, it was like, that was the thing, like every night that was my routine. So when I started keto and I would just sit down in front of the TV at night, it would like make me crazy. Like, you know, first I would like, just like do keto snacks. But then I realized like, this is not going to work. I can't be eating at 10, 11 o'clock at night. So I actually gave up TV for over two years. I stopped watching TV. I started reading instead because when I was, you know, I don't know, there was something different. Like I felt in front of the TV, I felt compelled to eat. Whereas when I'm reading a book, you know, food didn't occur to me. So I, I, you know, I did things like that. I gave up TV. I also would like play, you know, mental games with myself like the kitchen was closed I would close down the kitchen at night and I had to like think of it like you know if I had a let's say I had a a craving for something at my favorite restaurant and I get in my car and I drive to the restaurant it's closed it's locked the lights are out obviously I'm not getting that thing right so I just have to turn around and go back home so I 
you know, did this mental thing of, okay, well, my kitchen is closed. Just like if a restaurant was closed, I'm not getting in there. Even if there is something in there that I want, I can't have it now. If I still want it tomorrow, I can go in when the kitchen is open and get it. Um, I also would like, you know, I lived in, you know, everybody in my house is low carb now, but six years ago, they were not. And I would open my pantry and there'd be like six boxes of cereal and pop tarts and Oreos and like, you know, all the crap that we had in our house. And so I would have to mentally, you know, I'd open the pantry door and I'd have to mentally categorize everything. Okay. That food belongs to Brett and Nolan and Bradley. That's not Mary's food. So like I just made it so it wasn't even mine and it wasn't an, an option. Um, but those are just like temporary strategies. The, in the big picture, what we have to do is like, okay, why, why do I want to eat that? And what is it I believe it's going to do for me? So if, if I think, you know, so like if I've had a stressful day and I think the food is going to make me feel better, I have to like, look at the reality of that. Okay. Is eating the food going to make my stressful day disappear? Does it make it so that it didn't happen? No. And when I eat the food, what's going to happen in the aftermath? Well, I'm going to feel even more stressed because now I'm going to be pissed at myself that I went off plan again and I'm never going to lose the weight. I'm, my blood sugar is never going to go down. I'm, you know, my health is not going to improve if, if this is how I handle it. So if I'm stressed, what do I need? I, food is not going to fix it. What is, what can help my stress? Um, maybe calling a friend, maybe meditating or getting a massage or a pedic doing something where I get to relax, but food is not going to fix my stress problem. Or if I'm, um, say someone's lonely, food isn't going to make you less lonely. It doesn't make, you know, it, it's not going to make you less lonely. If we're lonely, what we need is connection with somebody. So that's the answer. You know, um, if we're tired, oh, I'm just too tired to like, do anything. I'm just going to eat whatever. Well, if we're tired, food is not what we need. Food doesn't fix tiredness. Rest fix tiredness. So if we're tired, the answer is not to eat. It's to go get rest. So we just have to like learn to identify like what is the real problem? Um, you know, food is not the go-to. Food is not the answer for everything. There's only one problem that food fixes and that's true hunger. Yes. That's so good. I think, um, you know, going to your TV thing, it makes a lot of sense. And it's so smart that you cut out TV because there's a thing of pairing. So our minds are, you know, we connect things. So like if you're used to working and then like snacking on something, then when you start working, you want that snack, right? It's kind of mm -hmm. like that Pavlov's, the bell and yeah. the dog um, um, salad yeah. thing. And so it makes sense that you just cut out the TV. And if you cut out the TV, then your chances of snacking diminish, at least while you're kind of getting a stronger foothold on, you know, just removing your relationship with food and, and emotionally. Um, and then it makes sense what you're saying that, you know, initially you have these kind of stop breaks in place just while you're getting stronger. And, you know, the longer you don't fall into a habit of, you know, using food as an emotional um, tool, then the longer it, it slowly will get easier. And so then you, the longer process is really to start, you know, questioning why you're even turning to food, right? So right. Those, are, those are the smart things to do. And I think those are great tips to get us, you know, on the right path. It's just, you know, I, I really think that people aren't putting enough effort into being more mindful about this food. You know, they're just, right. a lot of times I get so many um, comments about, or just, you know, questions of, oh, I'm not addicted to food, or I don't have that relationship with food. Like, just tell me how to do the carnivore diet. And it's uh -huh. like, there's something there that you're wanting to eat carnivore, right? So right. maybe it's not a full blown out disordered eating, but I think everyone has levels of, you know, using food as a coping mechanism. I mean, if you are having a stressful day and you're like, I just want to go grab some beers, like that can be it too, right? It's just right. people need to figure that out. Um, and it's just, you know, I think the process is starting and people are becoming more aware, but I mean, definitely people it's, it's hard work, but it's, I mean, that's how you're going to cure long-term and it looks like you're there, you know, like you don't even think about food when you're stressed, you do all the other things. And yeah, you know, like I wouldn't even say I'm a hundred percent there where you are and I would love to, and it's just taking steps. Right. Um, I mean, like even when this pandemic first started, 
Um, I remember just like I grabbed a diet soda, which I never do. And then like, and then I had like some sugar free gum and then I had a few nuts. And I remember I just did not feel well the next day. Immediately I had back lower back pain when I woke up and I'm like, this is exactly why I stay away because I feel swollen. Um, and it's just, it's getting to the point of like abject misery. So now I know because my household does have some junky foods because of my husband and then, but if I ever touch it the next day of how bad I feel, it's getting to the point that it's not worth it. And, right. You know, but it's, you have to get there and be aware of that to even understand. I think you just have to be more mindful. I think that's right. how, because if you're not, then I would not have attributed all those feelings to the food, you know, and now it's just that kind of comforting things of food is now turning into this. Oh, I know if I eat that, I'm going to feel like this, this, and this. And it's just, it's not worth it anymore. Yeah, definitely not. Like I like having like the, the the free, you know, I call it food freedom and you know, I like being food sober, but we never arrive. We don't get to this place of like, like I don't do sobriety perfectly. And my version of, you know, going off plan during this whole stay at home thing is I stopped doing the extended fasting. There was really no reason for me not to, but that because I'm not perfect. I mean, that's the thing that, you know, it, it wasn't like, you know, some people went off keto, some people went off carnivore and went keto. Some people, you know, and my version is, okay, I'm just going to do intermittent fasting instead of my extended fast, you know, like, so it's like always, you know, something, um, you know, I, but you know, we don't No, nobody like does it you know, perfectly, but I think that we all like have room for improvement. And as far as like, and there's definitely a, um, a spectrum of eating disorder, like some people are very mild and some people very severe, but I think even the general in, in general, like the average thin person who is generally healthy has some level of dysfunction with food. And the biggest example that I can think of is that you know, mo most people don't really know what real hunger is. We only know what cravings are. And we don't know what real hunger is because society has trained us to eat by a clock. So most everybody like thinks of, you know, hunger in terms of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, you know, when you go to a restaurant in normal times, right? If you go to a restaurant at five or six o'clock, how many people are there? Like that's dinner time. Right. But is everybody really always hungry at the same times every day? I mean, are we supposed to believe that everybody in the world is hungry at eight, noon, and five, you know? It, but that's something we've been trained to do. Whereas, you know, you learn through eating real food and following carnivore and keto that if you just listen to your body and, you know, when your hunger signaling gets fixed, that our hunger is cyclical. And most days we're really only going to eat twice. Maybe other days we do eat three or four times because our hormones have shifted or we were more active or something. But we, in general, most people don't eat the same exact way every single day based on their hunger being the same time every day. If we were to listen to our bodies, we would find that our hunger is very cyclical. I think they came up with that kind of eating schedule because um, it was supposed to follow like the farmers and right. their schedule. <laughs> Yeah. And, and when I mean, people started going to work in school, like it was set up for, you know, that yeah. reason. It's but funny. the other, another example is like when we, when you travel, right, we get on the airplane and they hand out snacks. Like I've never seen somebody turn down snacks. Like I'm, I'm always the one like in my row or whatever, like I'm the one not taking the snacks and they always say, are you sure? Yes. <laughs> I'm sure I don't want them, but everybody takes them. Does everybody on that plane at that moment, they're hungry. And so they eat it. No, they're just, they take it and they eat it because it's being handed out. We're trained to take it and eat it. That's so funny because I thought the same thing. I was like, it's so weird. Like we, sometimes the flights were only an hour to two hours. And it's like, is the process of getting on the plane so difficult that you're so <laughs> hungry that you have to have a snack within, you know, that short amount of time. And you're right. Yeah. Everyone's gets the snacks and then they're eating it as if they are famished. Yeah. It's so interesting. We are wired to eat. And then, you know, we also mimic what other people are doing. Uh, one thing I want to bring up is, you know, what you said, if, you know, no one's perfect. And um, James Clear talks about that in his Atomic Habits book, where 
it's okay if we fall once, just don't make it a repeated air, um, kind of falling. So, you know, the first day of falling is just make sure the next day you get up because each day you, I guess, regress, um, the exponential amount of kind of losing that momentum becomes much stronger. And so you don't want it to be like, well, I cheated today, so I'm going to cheat tomorrow and I'll just start on Monday because that like, each additional date becomes a bigger and bigger obstacle to get back on your feet. So right. I think we need to have grace and know that, you know, we fall and we're not perfect. I mean, I even had nuts, you know, this in the last month and a half and I felt terrible. Um, and, you know, I preach that that's probably of all the cars, it's one of the more worst ones to eat because of the, all the phytase lectins and all that. But yeah, I mean, it's, right. I'm, I'm human though, right? So, But it tends to be a go-to because it is one of those things that we find like textually satisfying. It's crunchy and it's also something we hold in our hand. So it's got the, you know, yeah. it's got all the elements of a snack in that, you know, the whole snacking thing. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, um, you know, if I ate macadamia nuts, which is more high fat without the protein, it's better like the peely nuts, but I went for almonds, which is like the worst of the worst in terms of like oxalates and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I don't know why that was always been my nut thing, um, my like choice of nuts. But yeah, um, if, is there anything else that, you know, as we're closing that you recommend for people, you know, on this weight journey? Um, you know, I think one thing for me would be give it time, right? Like patience is really important. I think a lot yeah. of people hear that keto and carnivore, it's like this magic diet where you lose weight right away. Yeah. Um, and so do you have any other tips? Yeah, I think, you know, the main thing is to be, you know, become cognizant, you know, and aware of your, your eating habits and, and your history. Like, I think too many people, they, they look too closely at the food. They're mostly wrapped up in the, the food, like which foods are the best and what should my macros be? And they're all wrapped up in that, in like the diet end of things. But I would just encourage people to really pay attention to that you know, beyond that, the relationship of food, what do you use food for? Are you using it only for hunger or are you using it in, in inappropriate ways? I think that that's the way that you're going to be successful long term. And people that feel like they're restricted and on a diet, it's because they haven't dealt with the emotional attachment to the food. If you're not emotionally attached to something, you don't feel restricted when it's removed. That's so good. So good and so true. Um, you know, where, where can people find you? And where, where can they find you um, about coaching? So the website is ketoevangelistcoaching.com. Um, and I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. And then also Coach Jessica and I do an eight-week food addiction and recovery group. Um, a new one starts like every four to five weeks. And then I can be found on Instagram and Facebook at ketomary 71 Okay. And I'll link to everything in the show notes. Well, thank you again for your time. You know, you're always so wonderful to have on. You always have so much good information, especially about, you know, just healing from our food addictions, which I think we all have it to some degree, right? It's yeah. no diet is going to heal that. And I think you're such a wealth of wisdom in terms of that. And you walked that walk. So. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Okay. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Mary. Bye. All right, guys, I hope this video has helped you guys and just allowed you to know that sometimes we need to put in a little extra work and tweaking to find the right optimal diet for us. Carnivore is a healing diet and it proves to have so many benefits, but sometimes we need to just optimize it to work the best way for us. All right, guys, you know the drill. Make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. Take care. Bye.